Welcome back to another episode of Handloader TV with me, your host, Jeremiah. And in this episode, we're going to be talking all about the new Colt Python. Now, this particular gun should look pretty familiar to those of you who subscribe to Handloader Magazine. It was featured on the cover of the December issue, number 335, and Brian Pierce talked all about it in his From the Hip column. And he did a great job comparing the old pythons and the new pythons, but we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we dive into the details of the firearm. However, I would highly encourage you guys to check out the magazine if you haven't already. It's packed full of great information, and a lot of times it coincides with what we're working on here on the video side of things. So on that note, I'd also like to start out with a little bit of a history. These Colt Pythons are chambered in 357 Magnum, and the 357 Magnum has been around for a long time. It was developed in 1934 as a joint venture between Winchester and Smith and & Wesson, and it was introduced in 1935, and it also had some pretty big names in the hand-loading industry and game working on it, such as Colonel Douglas B. Uh, Wesson, Phil Sharp, and even Elmer Keith had a hand in the development of the 357 Magnum. And it's been around a long time. SAMI maximum pressure is set at 35,000 PSI. Now that's not to be confused with the cup measurement, 35,000 PSI for the 357 Magnum cartridge. It also has a very long track record when it comes to hunting, um, everything from deer and hogs and stuff like that, medium sized game, and it has a very good track record for self-defense as well. And nearly equally iconic to the 357 Magnum cartridge is the Colt Python. So let's go ahead and take a little bit of a closer look at this firearm. So this is a new Colt Python made around 2020 and Colt was actually recently purchased by CZ. However, the Python itself has a long-standing and rich history because it was actually introduced originally by Colt back in 1955. And it was available for a long time. And when it first came out, it was a very sleek, stylish looking, futuristic looking six gun. I mean, you take a look at this guy and you think back to 1955 and what the firearms of the time looked like back then, this is very futuristic looking. And these new Colts, Colt Pythons are very reminiscent of the old Colt Pythons with some minor differences. But again, Brian Pierce does a great job of talking about the differences like at the back strap, the hammer, and all those little details that will differentiate between the old Pythons and the new ones. But the Python was available for a long time, uh, from 1955 all the way up to 1999. That's when Colt announced that they would be discontinuing the Colt Python. And one thing that you should remember, back then all of these guns were hand fit. It was typically one gunsmith, he'd get all his parts and he'd just hand fit everything. Colt actually had a special team to work on the pythons back in the day. And they did a fantastic job of hand fitting and tuning everything. Um, but of course, that made the manufacturing process of these guys extremely expensive. So in 1999, they discontinued the python. And it was still available up until 2005 in a, as a custom shop, custom order item. However, after 2005, that ceased. And shortly after that, and all the, leading all the way up to today, we've seen prices of the original Colt Pythons skyrocket. They've gone for a pretty penny and they've been highly sought after and they're very desirable six guns. So if you fast forward to 2019, Colt uh, announces that they're going to bring back the Python. And that's what we have here, the new slightly updated version of the Python. Of course, these guns aren't hand fit. They're most likely made on CNC machines and things like that. And it, of course, lessens the cost of production. So they were able to reintroduce the Colt Python, which is very exciting for me. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at this guy. Uh, these are built on Colt's iFrame or the 41 frame, which is a very nice frame. Uh, this one here is stainless steel. Uh, it has a very nice finish on it. I've actually sent quite a few rounds downrange in this particular revolver and all I had to do was wipe it down and it cleaned up very nicely. So it seems to be a pretty durable and rugged finish thus far. 
It does have uh, hardwood grips, and of course you have the Colt medallion in there. Everybody likes that, myself included. And they feel pretty good in the hand. Um, they're a little bit big for my hands, I think, but all in all, not too bad. Um, having shot it a little bit, it's hard to make a perfect decision on that, but they feel pretty good. And if you're a fan of the original Colt Python, it's a real similar feel in my opinion. So then we have the back strap here, which is smooth. We have a serrated hammer, a little bit different than the originals, but not bad. And also we have some trigger serrations in here as well. Now one thing I should note on those trigger serrations, after prolonged shooting, I could see those becoming a potential issue. Um, they're just a little bit aggressive and I could see them getting a little bit uncomfortable in time. Now I did also take a measurement of the trigger, an average of five pulls on this Wheeler Engineering trigger pull gauge in both single action and double action. So let's go ahead and walk through that. In the single action mode, the trigger broke cleanly and crisply at five pounds and five ounces. So, and of course we are empty here as always. The guns are double checked, triple checked. We're clear. So let's go ahead and show you the single action trigger pull here. Very smooth, very crisp just a little bit heavy. Now, one more time. There you have it. Now, as far as the double action goes, that broke at eight pounds, 12.4 ounces. Now, one more time. There are a lot of complaints about the new Python's trigger compared to the old trigger. There is one thing that I have noticed between the old and the new pythons. This new python, it is pretty smooth in my opinion compared to the old ones. The old ones had a lot of stack. And what I mean by that is you'd pull this trigger back. It would progressively get harder and harder and harder and harder until it finally broke. Now with this python, if I pull with about the same amount of force, it's very smooth. So that is something that should be noted. Rolling right along here, we have fully adjustable rear sight for both windage and elevation. And there's also a set screw on the top here to lock that adjustment in place to keep your slight sight from sliding. So that's a really nice feature. I do like that. And of course, those sights are different than the original. At the front sight out here, it's easily replaceable, so you can adjust the height, you can replace it with a fiber optic or whatever be your preference. I really like that and I think that was a smart feature from Colt. Another thing to note on these Colt Pythons is, just like the old ones, they do have a rather short ejector rod. Um, so that can be a little bit tricky to empty the revolver, but with good training practices and using gravity as your friend, that really shouldn't be too much of a problem there. So overall, I think the fit and finish is very nice on this revolver. Um, there's no sharp edges anywhere. Everything's nice and rounded off. Um, I will say the top strap is also heavier than the old Colt Python revolvers. They beefed that up a little bit. And supposedly the new Colt Pythons are supposed to be more durable. Time will tell on that, but I really hope so because the originals did have some durability issues. And we'll talk about that more after I shoot it and get some more trigger time behind it. So as I was saying earlier, the old guns are all hand fit. The new guns are probably manufactured on CNC machines, so they're cheaper to produce. And they're not really an apples to apples comparison. Obviously you can get a hand fit gun that is going to be really nice. But overall, from what I've seen from these Colt Pythons and what I've read, they seem to be fairly consistent and they seem to be pretty nice. And there's a lot of rumors about the bad hands, poor triggers, you name it. 
all kinds of people talking about it. This is one of the early models, um, fresh out of the factory. It's not the updated version. It's never gone back for um, to have the hand fixed or anything like that. So we're going to see if we run in, into any issues. So far we have about 150 rounds through this revolver, but we're going to put a whole lot more through it as we test our hand loads and do some more shooting with it. On that note, let's jump over to the hand loading side of things. Really quick before I forget, this Colt Python has a 6 inch barrel and they will be offering various different barrel lengths eventually, if not already. And this uh, is a 1 in 14 left hand twist on this particular gun. So the Colt Python is fully capable of handling 357 Magnum, 38 Special, and 38 Special Plus P. But for this video, we're going to be shooting solely 357 Magnum. And that should also provide the top-notch accuracy that we're hoping to get out of this firearm. So we've selected Redding dies. It's a three die set for 357 Magnum or 38 Special. So it's a combination set. Don't forget the shell holder. Redding uses a number 12 shell holder for 357 Magnum. And then for all of our brass, we're going to be using Starline cases. They're exceptionally high quality, very durable. You get a lot of firings out of these guys. I've been a big fan of them, and we use them quite a bit here on the channel. Uh, for primers, we're going to be using either CCI 500 or CCI 550s. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get over to that step. We'll be using uh, some high quality bullets here and various powders as well. So on that note, let me go ahead and briefly just kind of walk you guys through what I did to assemble our hand loads for this video. So of course I had brand new Starline cases. I've got my sizing dice screwed down until it contacts the shell holder, like so little bit of cam over on this Redding T7. And then since they're carbide dies, you don't need any case lubricant. And I sized all my cases. The reason why I did that, even though they were brand new cases at the time, these are once fired, but they were brand new at the time, I like to size them just to remove any dings or anything that might be in the neck and just to kind of uniform them out. So once I've finished sizing all of my cases, I'll flip over to my expanding die. Now this is something that's pretty important and I should note. So when it comes to expanding, especially the 357 Magnum, it has a very straight powder column, very narrow, but a lot of powder in there. So you're going to want to take care not to over expand the case mouth because you're going to want some tension in there. So, as you can see right now, this case is not expanded. The bullet will not fit into that case. So we'll run it up into our expander die, which granted is preset. So now I've just barely put a slight flare on that case mouth. Just enough so that that bullet will sit like this. I can't push it down there with my finger, it's too tight, it's not going to scrape the sides of the bullet as it's seated, but it will sit in there and I can get that bullet perfectly straight for when I go to seat it. You want to take care, I'm not so wor much worried about overworking the brass when I'm expanding, but rather I want there to be some tension on that bullet as it's seated. So the next step would be to prime. We'd prime using either CCI 500 or 550 Magnum small pistol primers. Now it really depends upon the powder that you choose. If you're using something like H110, Winchester 296, Little Gun, you're going to want a Magnum primer and a heavy crimp. That's very important because those powders can be rather difficult to ignite. And also they can lead to some pretty wild extreme spreads and standard deviations if you're not using a Magnum primer. So I highly recommend a Magnum primer with those powders. However, if you're using something like Accurate Number no. 9, 2400, Tight Group, Power Pistol, powders like that that aren't specifically Magnum powders, like the H110, 
I would suggest using a standard CCI 500 small pistol primer for those powders. You're going to get less pressure and you're going to get more performance out of that standard primer. So once we prime my cases, I personally prefer a hand primer. Um, I've primed on the press as well, it works great. But uh, we'll go ahead and expand these cases and we'll create some dummy rounds now that you know all about the primers. So, with my cases expanded, I'll swap over to my seating die. And of course, if we were making live cartridges, and for the development of the loads on this video, we would measure out powder. All the powder would be measured on an RCBS Matchmaster scale and would be accurate to four hundredths of a grain. But, since we're just making some dummy rounds for video purposes here, take my expanded case, seat my bullet on there, about as straight as I can get it, run it up into the die, and now I have my dummy round seated. Now, what I like to do, we'll go ahead and make a couple of these guys here, is I like to crimp as a separate step. I think it increases accuracy, um, you get more uniform overall loaded lengths, uh, and I just think you get a little bit better performance. So once I'm going to crimp, I'm going to back out this seating stem quite a bit. I will screw my die down until it contacts the case, and then I'll give it a little bit more of a turn. Now, I would call that a medium roll crimp which is not too bad. It's just a little bit of a crimp there, but you're not going to deform the bullet or anything like that. When you're using powders like H110, Winchester 296, Hodgdon Little Gun, I highly encourage you to really put a heavy crimp. Um, almost to the point where you're deforming the bullet, but not quite. You can see and feel that cam over on that press as I crimp. You're going to want something that's noticeable that you can see. And I would also encourage you guys, you know, if you're curious and you want this stuff to be repeatable, you can measure your crimps with your calipers, if you so desire. And then you have a repeatable number and you know what you've crimped at. For example, this cartridge is crimped at about 374. That's what it's all about. You want your hand loading to be easily repeatable so when you find a good load, you know exactly what you did to duplicate that. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. If you have any questions, as always, there's a comment section below. I'll do my best to answer every one of your questions when it comes to reloading for the 357 Magnum. On that note, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to do here. I've already preloaded my ammunition for this Colt Python. I've got quite a few loads loaded up. And what we're going to do is we're going to lock this guy down in the ransom rest and we're going to shoot five shot groups out of it. And we're going to rotate through each of the cylinders. I have, I'll have them marked so I know that I'm changing the cylinders up as I go, making sure everything's in spec and all that kind of stuff. And I'll take measurements of that as well to ensure that everything is perfect and all cylinders are equal in size and what have you. Then from there we're going to do a little bit of fun shooting and then we'll review the targets. Now when it comes to the target review, we're going to be testing a ton of loads. There's not going to be enough room for us to fit all of those in. So we're going to show you the best results that we get from our range trip. And if you want to see all the results, be sure to head over to our website, loaddata.com and check it out there. Just type in hand loader TV or something like that and look for the Handloader TV 357 Magnum loads in the Colt Python. And you'll be able to see all the groups that we post, all the results we get for free. The only thing you won't be able to see is the powder charge. We reserve that for subscribers and those who support this channel. So on that note, let's go ahead and take this guy. We'll hit the range and see what we can do with it. So as you can see, we're out on the range now. We have the Ehler Model 35P chronograph set up 10 feet from the muzzle to record all of our velocities. 
The target is downrange at 15 yards, and according to my Kestrel 5700 here, the temperature is 65.5 degrees Fahrenheit, altitude's 5,000 feet, humidity is 24.6%, and pressure is 25.28 in HG. For this first load, we've stepped it up to a max charge of Winchester 296 powder, 16 grains, uh, 158 grain Hornady XTP with a CCI 550 small pistol magnum primer, Starline cases, and an overall loaded length of 1.590 inches. And we have a heavy roll crimp applied to help with consistent powder burn. One other little thing that we did to this ransom rest is we installed on the trigger bar here a bearing that will kind of roll as we pull the trigger rather than grip the trigger and kind of slide. And we'll be shooting all these single action just for testing purposes. So let's go ahead and put them on the paper and see how this thing does. Here we go. And that looks pretty good from here, if my old eyes aren't failing me. <clears throat> this ransom rest makes it super easy for testing. It's been a great investment for the channel. And it just speeds the entire process up. So after last load's performance, I'm pretty excited to try out this next one. This is Shooter's World Powder, a 10.8 grain charge with Major Pistol. Sierra jacketed soft point, 125 grains in weight, CCI 500 primers, Starline cases, and an overall loaded length of 1.580 inches. We're all loaded up here. Put them to the test. There's our five shots, just like that. So rolling right along with our load development, we've swapped over to Power Pistol Powder, a 10 grain charge with 125 grain Hornady XTP, same CCI 500 primers, Starline cases, and an overall loaded length of 1.590 inches. So let's go ahead, see how they group. Well, from where I sit, that looks pretty good. I should probably also note that a few loads ago, we hit the 150 round mark, so we went ahead and cleaned the gun, and we fired a few fouling shots and then continued on with our load development. So next up, we're trying Hodgdon Tight Grip Powder, a 4.0 grain charge with 158 grade Hornady Frontier Lead Semi Wad Cutter. Uh, CCI 500 primers, same Starline cases, and our overall loaded length is 1.590 inches, and we've applied a medium roll crimp to these guys. Alright, 
Let's see how they do. This should make for a very nice light plinking load. And as you can see from the ransom rest, the recoil on these is pretty light. And there we have our five shots. The next powder that we'll be trying is Accurate number 9, a 12.2 grain charge with 180 grain Rimrock LBT WFN with gas check, sized to 0.358 inches. Starline cases, CCI 500 primers, and an overall loaded length of 1.575 inches. And I've applied a heavy roll crimp to try and tame some of those standard deviation and extreme spread numbers with this powder. So here we go. And as you can see, we're really getting into the full power 357 Magnum loads based on the recoil the ransom rest is taking. So I should probably note it is a new day of filming and the current weather conditions are 56 degrees Fahrenheit, wind at about 4 miles per hour from the 4 o'clock position, humidity is 35%, altitude is 5,000 feet, and pressure is 25.17 in HG. For the next load, we're using IMR 4227, a 14.6 grain charge with 158 grain rim rock semi wad cutter hollow point with gas check sized to 0.358 inches. Starline cases, CCI 500 primers, overall loaded length is 1.600 inches. So, let's test them. And there's our five shots, quick and easy. All right, let's run some single action on the paddles here. Yeah, that single action feels really nice. And as far as the speed loaders go, this is for an original python. It's a little tricky. It doesn't quite clear the grip frame there, but uh, it's manageable. All right, let's do some double action on the big steel here. There it is. I caught myself on that one a little bit. Not too shabby though. Double action feels pretty smooth actually. Probably a little bit better than your original Colt Pythons, as blasphemous as that sounds. See if I can't clean up a little bit here.
Ah, that was much better. Very nice and a whole lot of fun. So now that we're back from the range, we've got a ton of data to go over. We got some pretty good accuracy results out of this Colt Python and we'll dive into those details. I also did a ton of shooting with it offhand and, and just kind of getting a feel for the gun. And I got a pretty good idea for how it feels and how it works and its reliability. But first, let's go ahead and dive into our targets here. The first load that we tried out was using Winchester 296 powder with a 158 grain Hornady XTP, a fantastic bullet well known for its accuracy. And we got pretty Pretty good standard deviation and extreme spread there. Uh, maybe a little bit heavier crimp would have helped shrink those numbers a touch, but the group size was 0.58 inches. And anything under an inch, I'm going to be pretty happy with at the distance we're shooting at 15 yards. So overall, I would say that is a pretty good load there, and I'm very pleased with that. Also on another note, Winchester 296 is the exact same powder as H110. The only differences you're going to see is from lot to lot variation and that kind of thing. But generally speaking, the load data is identical for those two powders. The next load we went ahead and moved on and tried was using a little bit lighter weight bullet, a 125 grain Sierra jacketed soft point. And we got pretty high extreme spreads with this one, 160. And I'm not sure if that's because I didn't have an adequate crimp on this or, or what was going on. It was only a medium crimp. Perhaps I should have tried a heavy with the Shooter's World Major Pistol Powder. But we got a group size of 1.31 inches. So all in all, I'm not that upset about it, and perhaps this particular revolver just didn't really like any of the loads we tried with this Shooter's World powder, but this was the best result we got with that load. Moving right along to the next target we tried, uh, Power Pistol Powder with 125 grain Hornady XTP, and it seemed to really like this one actually. We got an extreme spread of 41, I'm pretty happy with that. Pretty good uh, velocity out of the power pistol powder as well. And we had a group size of 0.52 inches. Now also, as we're going through and reviewing these targets, make sure you check the primers to see whether we're using magnums or not. Uh, pretty much all of these are gonna be using standard primers moving forward. We just use the magnums with the Winchester 296 powder. But it's important to note that as you're loading for your 357, you pick the correct primer for the powder you're going to be using. All in all, very happy with that load, and that's probably going to be a go-to load of mine in this particular handgun. Rolling right along, I wanted something a little bit lighter, a more comfortable kind of plinking load, if you will, and something that's fairly cheap to load as well. So I settled on an Hodgdon Type Group powder, a four grain charge with 158 grain Hornady Frontier lead semi wad cutter with Starline cases, of course. And pretty good extreme spread of 36 there. The nice thing about tight group powder is it's not position sensitive. So even though there's quite a bit of room left over in that case, it still has a pretty clean and consistent burn, which I can appreciate. A group size of 1.25 inches and very light recoil on this load. So all in all, very happy with that. And then rolling right along, we switched over to a favorite powder of mine, Accurate Number 9. I used the heck out of this powder in everything from 300 Blackout to uh, 357 Magnum, all kinds of different cartridges. Uh, 5.7 by 28, I've used it in there as well. Great powder. We got an extreme spread of 56 and a group size of 0.74 inches with the Rim Rock 180 grain bullet. This would be a great hunting bullet, something for maybe like javelina that we have in Arizona, hogs, uh, deer, and I think it'd also be a viable self-defense weapon when it comes to dangerous games such as bears and stuff like that that we have in Arizona. If you're talking about Alaskan brown bears, you might want something with a little more punch than a 357. But for the 357, this is a fantastic bullet option, and we get really good accuracy out of that. And that's something that I've seen over and over with the Rimrock cast bullets. Now the final load that we went ahead and tried was using IMR 4227. This is one of my very favorite powders in 45 Colt. It's fantastic. Uh, we got an extreme spread of 36, standard deviation of 13, and a group size of 0.98 inches. And this is with 158 grain Rimrock uh, semi wad cutter hollow point. So that would be a nice expanding bullet option in this revolver. And accuracy under an inch, right there at an inch, pretty happy with that overall. 
So we got some really good loads with this revolver. Uh, there's a, a lot of ammo that was put through it. At the end of this video, I think I put well over five, 600 rounds through this particular gun. I did not have a single malfunction with the firearm. Um, and that's one thing I really want to talk to you guys about is the difference between uh, reliability and durability. The gun is proven to be 100% reliable. Every time I squeeze that trigger, the gun went off. No problems, no issues with timing or, any, or anything like that. However, the durability on the old guns was known to be an issue. In preparing for this video, I talked with a gunsmith who actually used to work on the old Colt Pythons, and he was very well known, very well renowned, former uh, gun sight gunsmith. And he was talking about the durability of the old pythons. And some of the issues they ran into is if you had your python in, say, a holster and you walked into a door frame and you smacked the butt of the gun on that door frame, you could actually throw off the timing of the revolver. Now, I haven't gone around smacking this revolver, so I can't really speak in volume to its durability. But time will tell, and as I continue to test and use it, and if I carry it on horseback and stuff like that, time will tell on that. And I'd be really curious to see how well these new Colt Pythons hold up, just based on looking at it, pulling the grips off, checking the clearances and how thick the metal is. It does seem to be more durable, or at least more robustly built than the old Pythons, but that is something to take note and consider in these new Colt Pythons. Also, the feel in my hand is very good. It fits my hands pretty good. The grips can be a little bit big towards the bottom here, but not bad, not bad at all. And of course, with stout recoil, it can be a little bit difficult to control, but nothing too bad. Overall, I'm very pleased with the performance we got out of this Colt Python. I'm very pleased with the accuracy we got. And overall, I think they're very nice guns. But again, this is just my opinion. You've seen the results that we've got. And you can make an educated decision for yourself if this is something you want to add to your collection or not. So thank you so much for watching. We really do appreciate it. And as always, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and let us know if you like this video click the subscribe button, and don't forget to hit the bell icon as well so you're notified when we post our next video. We have a lot of exciting projects in the works. And as always, if you have any personal experience, questions, be sure to leave those in the comments section below. I do my best to read and respond to every one of those. Sometimes it takes me a little bit, but eventually I'll get around to it. So thank you so much, and we will see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.